Hello dear brothers and sisters, welcome back to our channel, we wish you a very good day. May God bless those who are watching this video. We hope you will enjoy the video and subscribe to this YouTube channel to stay updated with the latest information. Let's accompany us and listen to this video until the last moment. Before discussing today's topic, let's pray, offering our supplication to God the Father. O Supreme God, in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you have sacrificed to save us, your pitiful children from the fires of hell, please hear our prayers. We offer you our humble sacrifices. We accept the challenges and sufferings as a means to bring redemption to souls in the warning. We beg you to grant mercy to sinners who find it difficult to return and to accept your mercy, so that they may offer you the necessary sacrifices and atonement before you. Amen. Do you believe the devil is simply there in the shadows, far away from you? That faith and goodness are impregnable barriers against his assaults. There is nothing that is more false than this. You underestimate how close the enemy is. Denying him is like shutting your eyes to an unavoidable truth. We shall come into contact with him at some point in our lives. He will attempt to take us with him when the inevitable moment comes for our face-to-face -face meeting. We need to be more ready and equipped than ever at this critical juncture to reject his invitation. Here, we'll discuss the several obvious and less obvious locations where we might run into the demon, particularly during that pivotal moment in our life when he will undoubtedly be there. We'll also explain how to fight oneself during that critical time. We will always have the chance to come across devils in our lifetimes. Some are rather self-evident. Living in or going into a house full of demons, for example, is something that exorcists know is usually caused by immoral activities carried out within the structure, including unnatural deaths like abortions, secret rituals like calling spirits, and demonic deeds like witchcraft. The common indicators of an infestation in these houses include sharp dips in temperature, shadowy figures, moving things, strange noises, and most importantly, an unpleasant smell. The Lord revealed to St. Catherine of Siena that the taint of Adam's sin had tainted and emitted a stink across the human race. Evil and sin both smell bad. On the other hand, there is a lovely scent whenever saints appear to souls. The cure for an infested dwelling is to spiritually purify it. Owners ought to make liberal use of sacramentals such as holy water, crucifixes, rosary prayers, and liberation prayers. Additionally, a deeply ingrained demonic presence occasionally calls for the priestly service of an exorcist. Sometimes the demons are hidden, thus none of the above-mentioned indicators are there. However, one of the first symptoms that exorcists have observed is when the family dog begins to bark excessively. It's a loud, ominous bark, rather than your typical one. Something very bad is being sensed by the dog. The Brownbill Demon case is the most frequently reported one. In this instance, the family dog would wait at the door of the parent's chamber at night and would bark frantically when the demon got close. Furthermore, young toddlers can sense devils and communicate their pain by weeping, according to research conducted by exorcists. However, exorcists have discovered demons stationed in non-infested homes. Those on Monsignor Rossetti's team with spiritual gifts who are able to detect the other realm are likewise gifted. These individuals record the locations of the demons identify the type of bad spirits they are, and even issue warnings when they are driven out. Demons are thought to congregate in regions where there has been sinful activity. However, they have also discovered devils in yoga instructors' offices and locations with statues of foreign religious deities. Monsignor Rossetti observed a pattern after doing these cleansings for years in locations with televisions, irrespective of the availability of the spiritually sensitive individual. Additionally, they consistently spotted a devil in the primary chair in front of the television, even in the absence of any infestation symptoms. Why was there practically always a demon present? Monsignor Rossetti explained that a lot of what we see on TV these days, and what society views as normal, is violent, pornographic, and often sinful. Because things that were deemed unacceptable only a few decades ago are now seen as acceptable. While demons view that stuff as a gateway to evil, our culture does not. While watching such content on television is unlikely to cause someone to become possessed, it will encourage demons to reside in the home. After that, it will be their responsibility to instill further turmoil, strife, and temptations within the family. 
Furthermore, the devils never go away. But before we pass away, there comes a point in life when we shall unavoidably confront demons. The biggest struggle for a person's soul takes place when their life is coming to an end. Doctors, nurses, and priests in particular, who have spent time alongside the dying, are aware that occasionally, pleasant deeds can be found in the lives of those who had decent lives. The terminally ill may, for instance, claim to be seeing a deceased relative or cry out, I am seeing my dead mother, or my dead aunt, or my child who died in childhood, or mention saints, angels, Our Lady, or Jesus. Additionally, there are frequently dark manifestations in the case of persons who led a mixed or wicked life. However, evil appears to even the greatest saints, those who the church will finally canonize as saints. Some saints have seen firsthand how Satan appeared to them as they were dying, reciting their sins and demanding that they become his. However, the saints knew that it is his kindness that saves them, so they turned to face Jesus and begged for pardon. Thus, the final stages of life involve a cosmic struggle for the dying person's soul. Consequently, the devil steps in to seize the individual's eternal life. And with the confession that is contained in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, formerly known as extreme unction, how do we defend ourselves? Allow me to explain the reference made by Father Gabriel Amorth. A dying woman needed the anointing of the sick, so a priest answered the phone in the middle of the night. When he arrived at the hospital, he saw an old woman who was near death and whose breathing was quite difficult. The person was so frail and in such physical agony that she was unable to make a last confession and, as a result, could not be freed of her sins. It was evident that the body would expire at any time. She was unable to move her lips because she was so weak. The priest instructed her to turn to the Lord and seek his pardon, then to turn back to him and give him a quick glance after she was done. She would then realize that she was done, and he would grant her the Lord's pardon. Thus, she acted. When she looked up, she engaged in a private conversation with God. When she looked back at the priest, he realized she was done, and granted her absolution. Her respiration returned instantly to a calm, steady, and regular rhythm, and she passed away quite instantly with a tranquil expression. Absolution provided relief from whatever ailed her spirit and from the demon's attack she was going through. And it seemed from her look that she had vanquished the devil in the final seconds of her life. Finally, we reach the tool we need to protect ourselves from the devil when we pass away, a priest who absolves us of our sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for watching to the end of the video. What do you think about today's topic? Please leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel, press the bell button, next to receive notifications when the latest video is available.